Welcome everyone to St. Paul Lutheran Church, uh, our Christmas Eve service, our online service, the first time we've had a Christmas Eve online service. So glad you could join us, whether you are joining us from not too far away or on the other side uh, of the world, whether you're in your kitchen, living room, dining room, wherever you are, welcome. We are glad to have you as we celebrate uh, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world. Uh, hopefully, uh, you got to get a, a gift bag uh, for this service. So if you got one, go ahead and, and grab it. If you don't have a gift bag, uh, that's okay. Some items, though, you might want for this worship service are some candles uh, and, and some bells. So uh, just be aware of that. But otherwise, even if you don't have those things... Uh, we're glad you are here, and we know that God is indeed present today as we worship Him. Please rise as we call upon the name of our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we draw near to the Word made flesh tonight, we confess our sin before God and each other, clinging to the certainty of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We confess. Father, we humbly bow before you on this night 
filled with awe at your great love for us. We know we are unworthy of such love because of our sins in thought, word, and deed. Yet in the midst of our failings and desperate need, you have given us the gift of your only Son, our infant Savior. We give you thanks for sending the Christ child into our world, demonstrating your perfect love and action as Jesus lived and died for us. Forgive our sin this night and fill us with the everlasting peace only you can give as we continue to live in the reality of being both sinner and saint, dependent upon Jesus, who laid to rest in the manger and shed his blood on the cross for our redemption. Amen. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The scriptures thus have revealed, when the good, goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, who poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Holy people, redeemed of the Lord, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now encounter God through his word. Our first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading for today comes from St. John's first letter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. This is how the birth of the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. 
the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, on the screen in front of you, there is going to be a picture. And this picture is the last picture we took, or the last worship service, before COVID hit. Uh, uh, Jeff uh, Kester, our worship director, just decided to, to take a picture, thought it was a good time, and, and this is the very last time we all gathered together as the people of God. Do you, do you remember when we used to get together? Do you remember those days? Do you remember the, the altar, the candles, uh, the music, the energy, the, the, the children laughing and dancing and singing? Do you remember the, the fellowship, the community of faith? Do you remember receiving the mysteries of God, the, the sacraments? If you had known that that was the last worship service, regular worship service we were going to have, and it's been almost a year, would you have maybe stayed a little bit longer, lingered just a little bit? Would you have tried to take it in just a little bit more? If you hadn't gone to worship that weekend, for whatever reason, maybe if we had known that that was going to be the last worship service in a while, that uh, we would have made an extra effort to go. In a lot of ways, this picture seems a world away, right? We, so much in our world has changed. We, we've lost so much. You know, right after this picture was taken... Uh, right afterwards, uh, vacation started being canceled, right? Sports uh, stopped being uh, played. School uh, went uh, virtual. Uh, then there were uh, the, the shelter in, in places. And then people started to get sick and our life, lives changed drastically. For many of us then, home became this place of, of refuge, this place of refuge from the chaos that was going out out in the world. But it didn't take long for that, that chaos out there to enter into many of our own homes. If, if you had uh, to work from home and watch uh, kids from home and, and everything else, all of a sudden the, the, the boundary lines between work and family, everything became blurred and a lot of people became overwhelmed and burned out by all that they had to do. For many, you know, your home became a place of refuge, but now it was a much more lonely place of refuge. And yet, not everything was lost, right? Uh, thank God for the miracle of technology. Because, because of the internet, we could still video chat with our, our loved ones even though we couldn't uh, see them. We could still... Uh, we still had Netflix, right? We could, we could still watch our, our favorite uh, shows. And we could also still worship, right? St. Paul, we never closed a single weekend. Uh, we, we brought the worship out uh, to you. Of course, uh, that worship the weekend after, it wasn't like the weekend before, Right? Worshiping from home is a little bit different, and, and, and maybe some ways it's a, it's a little bit more relaxing, right? Because you can, you can worship in your PJs, you have bare feet, you're sipping on some coffee. Worship is now maybe, again, more relaxing. Uh, if you have kids, maybe worship is a little bit uh, more dangerous because you are more relaxed, you have bare feet, and the Legos are strategically placed all over the living room floor, and those Legos are just daring you to get that second cup of coffee unscathed. Worship is a little bit different now, but hopefully this time has reminded us of one really important thing, and that is that God is with us, that he is still there. After all, this is what Christmas is all about. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, of course, we knew God was with us when we went to church, right? At, at least I hope you did. Uh, but at church, for the most part, we, we were all dressed up, right? Uh, when we went to church, we made, we made sure to, to put on our smiles no matter what we were feeling. Uh, remember when you used to be 
able to go out and see people's smiles. Yeah, I, I miss those days. When, when we went to church, uh, we, when we drove to church, we left the chaos of our houses, and this gave us perhaps a few minutes to kind of put ourselves together so that we could go to church, and for this hour of putting ourselves together, then surely God was with us. How much more then for Christmas? The Christmas outfits, the candles, the songs, the holy silence. How great that every year we got to gather together and meet Jesus here in this place, just like the shepherds did on that first Christmas. I don't know about you, but the Christmas Eve worship, of all the worship services, it was just one of those worship services where not only did I believe that God was with us, but it seemed like I could see it, like I could feel it. But now we are, for the most part, no longer in God's house. Instead, we are in our, our own houses. Which gets me then to the Christmas story, right? This story that you are all probably pretty familiar with. Mary and Joseph, they are traveling to Bethlehem. And the reason they're traveling to Bethlehem is because of a census, And usually when I picture them traveling to Bethlehem, I picture Mary uh, sitting on a donkey uh, as the donkey walks and Joseph guiding uh, the donkey, uh, maybe a staff in hand. Of course, the scriptures never actually mention a donkey. Most likely, uh, Mary and, and Joseph, they both walked by foot to Bethlehem, even though Mary was great with child. And of course, when they arrive in Bethlehem, Uh, It is packed with people because of the census. And because of that, Mary and Joseph, they go to an inn, but the inn is already full. But thankfully, someone, maybe the innkeeper, maybe someone else, uh, shows them to a a stable, probably on the outskirts of town. And it's in this, this rustic old stable, this barn, where baby Jesus is born and then placed in a manger. And so we have this picture that there is, there is Bethlehem, and all the people of Bethlehem, they're, they're sleeping in their houses, they're sleeping in their, their inn, and the, and the chaos of all the people, and, and yet there is Jesus, far removed from the chaos, in the peaceful stable filled with gentle, ele- gentle animals, uh, and uh, just the starry sky overhead. Jesus is God with us, but in the Christmas story, he's kind of out there, right? Out in, in the stable. Now, sure enough, the, the shepherds, they go and visit him later on, the wise men. In fact, if you look at nativity scenes, I often feel like they look like churches. And the, the, the wise men and the shepherds, they're like the worshiping congregation. But they all have to go to where Jesus is is like Jesus is with us, but we still have to to go to him. We still have to go to church. But actually, the Gospels paint a little different picture of what Christmas was like on, on that very first Christmas. Again, the text says that Jesus was placed in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. But that word inn, I-N-N, in the Greek, it's actually a very, a very general term. So on the one hand, it can mean an inn, like a holiday inn, but there's, there's actually another Greek word that more specifically means that. Uh, most often, the word used here is used to refer to a, a guest room or an upper room. You see, houses back in Jesus' day, they, they weren't much like our houses. They pretty much consisted of one main room, and then attached to that room would be a guest room, either on the side or maybe on, on top, and that room was specifically there for hospitality, for when you had people over. That was their room. And so Bethlehem, of course, is busy because of the census, but also it is the Festival of Tabernacles, which we'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow on our Christmas Day uh, service. But because of that, uh, probably uh, Joseph had family in Bethlehem, but their, house, their houses were already full, the, their guest rooms were already full, so Mary and Joseph, rather than getting a private 
guest bedroom by themselves, they are in the living room, the family room, where the rest of the family is at. And not only that, but uh, that living room was where everyone slept. And not just the people, but the animals slept inside too, right? The animals were super valuable. You wouldn't le- let them sleep outside. They could run away or get stolen. So, so it makes sense that when Jesus is born, he's, he's placed in a manger inside the main living room of the house. So it wasn't just this, this peaceful night out in a stable under the starry sky, but when Jesus is placed in a manger, quite likely it was in the middle of a chaotic living room filled with animals, people, and hay. Now, to be sure, this doesn't mean that you need to get rid of your nativity sets. I'm not going to get rid of mine. Uh, nativity sense, sets or scenes are not designed to be historically accurate, and that's okay because they're designed to tell a greater theological truth. But think about what that means for just a second. Jesus, when he is born, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, that Jesus enters our living rooms, right? He enters our messes, our chaotic world. Jesus is present here in church for sure. But the true meaning of Christmas is not that we have to go where Jesus is, dressed in our Christmas best, but that rather he comes to us where we are in our loneliness, in our sickness, in our chaos, and to the very family rooms of our lives. Your living room, your family room, wherever you are watching, is holy because Jesus is there The church here is holy because we believe that Jesus is here through his word. Your life is holy because God is with you. For in baptism, God made you his dwelling place. The picture that we saw of church a little bit earlier, Jesus was there. But Jesus also said that he would be with us. A week after that picture, when many of us were wide awake in the middle of the night, filled with anxiety about what the future would hold. Jesus is there when your house is a mess, filled with chaos. God is not a God who looks from afar, but he is Emmanuel, God with us. And I think this leads to another profound truth, not only that God is with us in our mess, but if you think about it, if God is with you right now, wherever you are, and God is with me where I am, and God is with your friends down the street, and he's with your family members, maybe on the other side of the country, and and if God is with our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, then maybe just maybe we are not as isolated as we think we are. That when God is present with us, that the barriers of space and time which separate us from each other maybe are not as fixed as we think they are. I read an excellent article at the beginning of the pandemic uh, from The New Yorker. Uh, The writer was uh, Casey uh, Kep. And she talked about the Lutheran church that she grew up in. She, she was baptized in this Lutheran church, confirmed in, this, in, in a Lutheran church, and uh, she, was, uh, she was going to be buried at this Lutheran church. It was a, a church out in the country. And in the article, she recalls how, as a little girl, she used to help her dad uh, welcome people into church and, and hand out bulletins, right? Remember those? But the thing that she she enjoyed the most about serving in church was when her dad would ring the bells uh, at at the church. And he would ring the bells at the start of the worship service and at the end of the worship service and then kind of in the middle of the worship service when when the congregation said the Lord's Prayer. And so when this writer went, when she got older, she went uh, to the pastor of the church and asked him, well, why do we ring the bells when we pray the Lord's Prayer. And in response, the pastor asked her if she could name any farmers or any homebound people who couldn't make it to worship that day. And then the pastor said this, 
we ring the bell for them so that they know that when we have gathered and when we are sent back into the world, and so that no matter how far they are from the sanctuary, they can join us in reciting the words that Jesus taught us to pray. For almost as long as the church has existed, bells have called Christians together when they have been apart. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this Christmas, for many of us, we are apart from each other. But we are not alone. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And his presence not only connects us to him, but it connects us to each other, the, the entire family of God. In your Christmas bags, if, if you have those, grab those bags. In those bags, we put some bells. And the reason we put some bells in there is to remind you that you are not alone this Christmas. That when you ring those bells, yes, we are apart, but we are not alone. Not only that, but bells are usually rung at times of victory. You see, the Savior of the world not only broke into our very homes, he broke into our very sinful lives. He broke the wall of sin and death that we had put up between ourselves and God and between ourselves and our fellow human beings. And so if you are listening to this, I ask that you ring your bells now to remind you that in Christ we have victory and we have life. But not only that, set your timer for 6 p.m. Christmas Eve and 10 a.m. Christmas morning and go outside at those times and ring the bells. Ring the bells so that those around you may know that God is with them. And who knows, maybe you'll hear someone else ringing their bells and be reminded that God is with you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Jesus is truly Emmanuel, God with us, and God with you wherever you are. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God Almighty, we come before you on this most holy night in awe and at wonder and majesty of the Incarnation. The Savior of the nations has come, and with joy we greet our newborn King. Let the proclamation of his birth sound forth throughout the world. Give to your church faithful pastors to proclaim the good tidings of his birth, and give to your people willing ears to hear and believe. In the birth of your Son, you have signaled the beginning of a new creation. While we still live in a world racked by the ravages of sin, we know that, your final, that the final victory is yours. Watch over and keep safe emergency workers and all those whose vocations keep them from their families this evening for the well-being of our families. In the birth of your Savior, you have visited and redeemed your people. Continue to visit those who are lonely, sick, recovering, or near death. Let your presence be a comfort to them and give them perseverance until the time you grant healing, relief, deliverance, and peace. In the birth of your Son, and by his death and resurrection, you have reconciled the world to yourself. Keep us ever mindful that Jesus is for all people, and give us opportunity to tell others the good news of his coming, so that they may join in the praise of your holy name. In the birth of your Son, you have called people of all times and places into the body of Christ that is the church. We give you thanks for all the believers who have gone before us, especially those who have been with us during Christmas's past and are now with you. Give us a sure confidence in your promise of resurrection and eternal life and bring us at last together with them into your presence at the full coming of your kingdom. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, 
trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. At this time in our service, uh, we are going to sing the song, A Silent Night. If you can, take the candles out of your bag, or if you have any candles, and you can go ahead and light those. Again, uh, be careful. And uh, at this time, uh, if you have uh, loved ones uh, around you, uh, give them a hug, as we often don't have uh, time to do that during uh, this busy Christmas time. And then in uh, the silence, uh, in, with the light of Christ, the light of our candles burning, uh, we sing the song together, Silent Night. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen.